Today on Twin Cam, we're looking at what's probably the most niche car we've ever seen on this channel, and most definitely the rarest. It's a car that came out of nowhere really and attempted to follow in the footsteps of one of history's most popular performance cars. But in the event, it was a victim of a manufacturer that struggled to survive and only 46 were ever built. So this is the AC Brooklyn's Ace. Before we get into it, this car is to be auctioned at Manor Park Classics. So if you'd like to get your hands on one of the rarest British sports cars ever made, then please do follow the link in the description. But back to the car itself, and AC Cars has a curious history. It's a classic story of a low volume British car manufacturer that never quite managed to make big enough or consistent enough profits. But despite only ever making a handful of cars, AC's name lives on in legend thanks to the famous Cobra, a variant of the original AC Ace with a big Ford V8 shoved under the bonnet. The company that became AC Cars was founded in 1901 by the Weller Brothers, making it one of Britain's oldest car companies, and they sunk their teeth into producing a relatively wide range of different cars catering for different markets. But following the First World War, they began to find their niche with modest success in racing and rallying, with victories in speed trials, record-breaking speed runs, and even winning the Monte Carlo Rally in 1926. Unfortunately, AC collapsed following the Wall Street crash in 1929, but was rescued shortly after and production restarted in 1932, though on a small scale. Following the Second World War, AC was building cars like the 2 litre saloon, but made its money through contracts, most notably building Invercars, which British people of a certain age will no doubt remember as the standard government-supplied transport for disabled people. However, AC is best remembered for its sports cars, and they launched the Ace in 1953, opening the door to what they're best remembered for. The Ace won its class and finished 7th overall at Le Mans in 1959, and in the meantime, the AC Aseca came along, a coupe version of the Ace that was among the fastest road cars in the world. But in 1961, a certain Carol Shelby got on the phone. He wanted a racing car that could beat the likes of the Corvette, so proposed an AC Ace with a small block Ford V8, the car that became the AC Cobra. The Cobra was phenomenally fast, becoming too fast for the chassis, and the ultimate Mark III Cobra, featuring a 7-litre, 430 brake horsepower engine, was almost totally different to the little Ace that began the story. But in Britain, at least, the Cobra is probably most famous for one story. In 1964, during testing for Le Mans, a man named Jack Sears was driving a Shelby Daytona, an aerodynamic coupe version of the Cobra, down the M1 and hit 185 miles per hour. Time moved on though, and as Shelby focused on the new Ford GT40, AC were left floundering. Barring the Invercar, they had nothing to sell between 1973 and 1979 when the 3000 ME was launched, but they only managed to sell 101. And that latest failure brings us to the Brooklyn's Ace. In the mid-1980s, the old AC cars went into receivership and the rights were bought by a man named Brian Anglis. Anglis? Angelis? Now, Angelis also had a company called Autocraft, and they were making their money by building continuation Cobras. And as you'd expect, they had big Ford V8s under the bonnet. Now, with the AC brand back in the picture and that partnership with Ford, an all-new sports car suddenly became a realistic proposition. But before anything could happen, Angelis needed to cosy up to Ford, and a group of Blue Oval executives were invited to study Autocraft's work. Ford were so impressed that they offered to sell these Cobras through their main dealer network in the United States, enormously increasing Autocraft's potential market. 
but at the same time, it opened the door for that new sports car. And the new AC Ace concept was shown at the British Motor Show in October 1986. This was the first time ever that a non-Ford project had been displayed on Ford's stand. But there it was. And fitting it was too, because none of this would have been possible without Uncle Henry's involvement. The shape was crafted by men who were working out of Ford of Europe's design centre even. But the concept itself is aggressively 1980s in its appearance. It's wedgy, squared off, but incredibly neat, with more than a hint of Mazda RX-7 thrown in. In my eyes, I go so far as to say that this new AC Ace was better looking than anything that was carrying a Ford badge at the time. And under the skin, almost everything carried a blue oval stamp, with bits of Escort, Sierra and Granada making it tick. Now, a running car was never actually built, but the Ace's powertrain appears to have been set to come out of the Sierra in one of two options. First is the 2.9 litre Cologne V6 and four-wheel drive from the Sierra XR 4x4, but alongside it was the famous turbocharged YB from the Sierra Cosworth, also with four-wheel drive. So back in 1986, things were looking golden. Here was a smart and potentially very capable target top coupe that wouldn't have cost the earth. But as I just alluded to, the Ace was never really developed. So time ticked on and on and on. Autocraft were working out of a tiny factory at Brooklands and they couldn't keep up with demand for Cobras, which made Ford irritable and eventually they pulled out. The media reported that the Ace was dead as a concept, so contrary to all expectations, in 1991, it was suddenly back on the cards. AC had almost totally redesigned that original concept, leading to the launch in 1993 of the AC Brooklyn's Ace. But the car we saw back in 86 seemed to be distinctly modern and European in its concept. It had four-wheel drive and was completed by a massively understated appearance. Yet the car we have before us today is none of those things. For starters, people would no doubt have dismissed it as a fancy Sierra. And if they were going to revive the name, it would make sense to revive the philosophy as well. And that's what this car really does. Curvaceous styling, rear-wheel drive and a thumping great V8 up front. And it makes sense to start with what made it tick. The basic chassis is the only major component that survived the refresh, and it was designed by Len Bailey, a Ford man through and through who was intimately involved with the GT40. But as a freelancer later in his career, he came up with a stainless steel monocoque that would underpin the new AC. In fact, this was the first production car in the world with a stainless chassis. And because of the nature of the material, Bailey made sure that it was tremendously heavy duty. To go along with the over-engineered chassis was a hand-rolled, fully aluminium dress, which no doubt made the Ace expensive to build, but gave it presence and legitimacy as a genuine sports car contender. Beneath Bailey's chassis was running gear of a similar nature, with tailor-made double wishbones at all four corners, twin shock absorbers and a limited slip differential at the back, as well as anti-lock brakes. In the middle was either a five-speed Borg Warner manual or a four-speed automatic, and up front was exactly what you'd expect in a true AC. Despite Ford's abandonment of AC, they were more than happy to continue supplying parts, and no part is bigger than the engine. Autocraft were of course building Cobras, and powering them was the same small block V8 that had been used in the 60s, though now with fuel injection, and the Ace was the recipient of that very same engine. It may have been rather old fashioned by this point, but in the Brooklyn's Ace it displaced 4.9 litres and produced a rather modest 225 brake horsepower. To be fair, Details on the engines are rather scarce for obvious reasons, and I found it reported in certain places that earlier cars did have slightly more power. But this good old overhead valve unit gives the Brooklyn's Ace both pedigree and tradition. 
And when you're trying to revive an old mark, those are the things that matter more than modernity or serious power. The final result was a 1450 kilo curb weight, a 50-50 weight distribution and a car that reportedly worked brilliantly. Without any kind of marketing team to please, AC could produce a car for an enthusiast to enjoy. And in spite of the elderly power unit, the general consensus was that they produced a car far in excess of anything you'd ever expect from such a tiny company. But here's where the confusion starts to come in, because otherwise, it's a bit hit and miss. Although I really like the 80s concept, I understand that in reality, it was rather generic and characterless. And that's not a criticism you could aim at the final car. None of it is over the top, but the rear haunches give it muscle, and for 1993 the circular rear lamps and delicately styled bumper with oval exhausts is right on the money. But round the front is where it all seems to fall apart. Apparently, it was designed with XJ220 style covers over the headlamps, but for one reason or another they didn't make production, and I think that's a travesty. In the end, the quad headlamps that might just be from an E30 BMW are an afterthought, totally out of keeping with the rest of the design as it flows over the curvy front wings. It would have been so much sleeker had retractable panels been fitted. And though the indicator and side lamp units are fine, the front grille is simply boring. Head on, the car has a gormless expression, and I'm really ashamed to say that, because otherwise, they did such a good job. And inside, there's a lot more of that mixed bag, because for a car built in tiny numbers by a tiny company struggling to survive, the materials in here are phenomenal. It's all brilliant leather and there's wood and there's suede on the dashboard as well. It's genuinely wonderful. But then you've got all the Ford parts bin bits. And, you know, on paper, that's fine. Every sports and supercar manufacturer used parts from mainstream manufacturers. Lotus and Lamborghini, for example. But on this scale, it looks low rent versus the very high rent base materials. And, it reminds me very much of the MG RV8, which realistically was an MGB that Rover had put back into production with a few extra niceties in order to keep the MG brand in the public's consciousness until they could launch the MGF. And although that car has a bit of a cult following, it wasn't really successful. Not only because it was archaic mechanically, but because inside it didn't feel modern. It felt not like a pastiche, but it felt like old and new had been shoved in a blender and then it put on max speed for a couple of minutes. That's exactly how this feels, because you've got, you know, the brilliant leather and stuff that on this scale looks quite old fashioned and good. It looks retro in that kind of way. But the wood here, it's that awful kind of wood that Mercedes Benz were using in the early 90s. And when combined with the materials and the switches, it's not right. It just comes off all wrong and that's such a shame because fundamentally they've done a fantastic job. In front of me I've got this personal steering wheel which is you know the kind of steering wheel they used in Formula One cars and it's got a proper AC centre to it as well. I mean yes you have Ford stalks but they feel more than good enough and in here there is something that tells of what AC were going for. Because they weren't building a little, you know, a little sports car like an MX-5, but with a big V8. They were building something luxurious and potentially grand touring in nature. I mean, it's got things like a heated screen in here, thanks to Ford. It's got heated seats and it's got air conditioning. And these leather seats are just so comfortable and so supportive as well. You've got electric windows and an electric hood even. This is a seriously high-end car. But then the sportiness of it is totally taken away by the automatic gearbox. So it's confusing the interior because on a baseline, it's brilliant, but it just falls down in a number of small but important ways. I bring up that point because of where AC were pitching the Ace. 
Judging by the powertrain and style, I place it somewhere between that MG and a TVR, both of which are considered very British cars. But I'm wrong. In period, AC thought of this as a luxury Grand Tourer that blurred the lines with the powerful sports car. That's evidenced by the electric roof, the air conditioning and heated seats, as well as the automatic transmission of this car. Think Mercedes-Benz and Porsche rather than TVR, and that's why I think they got the vibe wrong. They were never going to make many cars, but I can't help but feel that in the mid-1990s, they were looking for a market that barely existed. In the end, the majority of the Aces customers were those who were in love with the brand and had fond memories of the Cobra rather than a new generation. The Brooklyn's-based AC built 46 of these cars between 1993 and 1996, when inevitably, they went bankrupt. But the Brooklyn's Ace was very affordable when placed in that kind of company. At just under 50 grand, it was three grand cheaper than an XJS, and a Mercedes of the like was up at around 70,000. But because it had all this equipment, was built so well generally by such a tiny company, with so many man hours going into every car, that AC lost a fortune on every single car they made. One source, I don't know how trustworthy, suggested that figure to be around £100,000 per car. But remarkably, out of the ashes of the Autocraft Brian Angelis based AC came another company. And the Ace was reintroduced with a facelift, different equipment and some different trim only the following year. It ran until 2000 and, rather predictably, they made 12 of them before going bankrupt themselves. The Ace nowadays is a total curiosity and it's a car that when you see it just on the surface looks like a low volume half-baked attempt at a classic British sports car with a big V8 in it. But when you look at it with the context and look at exactly what it brings, it's phenomenal it ever got to the road in the first place and that kind of loss faced by Brian Angelis's company is testament to how much went into making these cars. So on that note, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to TwinCam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then please do follow the link in the description. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.